You are tuning into the Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Volkan Emre, along with a dynamic team of Kellogg School of Management alums. We are here on a shared mission to uncover the mindset that drives impact and success. On Lehigh, we have talked provoking conversations with incredibly successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors from around the globe. We uncover the mindset that drives them, allowing them to make a high impact without losing themselves to ego. Now, let's get started with today's episode. Hi from Chicago. Today we are with Matthew Taylor, the founder and managing partner of MTT Ventures and the president of Trans Machine. Trans Machine is an industrial manufacturing company focusing on heavy duty truck, oil and gas and agriculture industries. Prior to his entrepreneurship through acquisition journey with Trans Machine, Matthew was the head of sales and marketing of North America and Japan at Filtration Group. He was also a board member at Filtran Japan, a subsidiary of Filtration Group, which is a global leader of mission-critical filtration solutions. Matthew is a distinguished alum of the Kellogg School of Management's Executive MBA program and Georgia Institute of Technology. Matthew. Thank you very much for hosting me today at Trans Machine uh, and giving me a tour um, of your wonderful facilities. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here. Thank you very much for hosting me. We're more than happy to have you. Uh, yeah. It's an honor to be on the podcast here. Oh, that's, that's, that it's going to be a great one. I, I'm sure about it. Uh, I want to start with the rapid fire questions to get us all warmed up. Are you ready? A hundred percent. Okay. <laughs> I think I know the answer of this question, but I'm still going to ask. So coffee or tea? All right. So if you're going to rapid fire the questions, do I have to rapid answer them or can I go, can I go into some detail with the answers? <laughs> um, as you wish. All right. yeah. so, so seeing as we've just had shots of espresso, yep. I never drink coffee. Really? I only take espresso. Okay. <laughs> and who doesn't love a good black tea? Right, I, mean, I think I think you have to have both, right? You're so, talking to a Turkish guy, yes. Uh, <laughs> and Turkish coffee and, and Yemeni coffee, one of the best, in my opinion. I will pick honestly Turkish tea over uh, okay. Turkish coffee. What's your personally. favorite Turkish tea? Uh, we, we we drink black tea. Black tea. We, okay. we we produce black tea and drink black tea. Uh, yeah, in the northeastern part of Turkey, it's like a massive black tea uh, production area. I'm moving to the next uh, rapid fire question. Um, Dogs or cats? Dogs all day. <laughs> I have to say cats because my wife brought them into the relationship, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Mountains or beaches? Why not both? Why, Why not? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this. If you had asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have said beaches uh -huh. all day. But you never, you never know what to appreciate until you've climbed a couple thousand feet in the Rockies mm -hmm. and you stop and you look up. And you're the tallest thing around. You're like, that's unbelievable. Yeah. So both, but both. mountains are, are, you know, it's not a bad thing. Slight edge, yeah. So text or call? Call, which I don't know how old you are, but mm -hmm. given my age range, I find is rare. Most, you know, people my age want to mm -hmm. text. So Sonny said text, which was really surprising, right? In the interview that you had with him. Yeah, maybe he was <laughs> with hands off. <laughs> yeah. Um, music or podcast? Oh, podcast all day. Come oh. on. Your podcast specifically. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to generate more content like for you then. So uh, PC or Mac? PC. Mm -hmm. Until I had a conversation recently about how good Mac is on the user you know, the, the, the support. And so it made me reconsider. Maybe I should go to Mac. I have detested Mac my whole life, but mm -hmm. well, PC, you know. Okay. Um, drive or fly? Fly. Come on. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get points if you drive. You're right. <laughs> Very good point. And um, last one. What's worse, um, dishes or laundry? I love doing dishes. Okay. I absolutely love doing dishes. What better time to reflect when you're staring out a window and it's snowing outside? 
laundry. I don't name somebody who likes to do laundry or fold laundry. Mm -hmm. That's that's the kryptonite of any that, man. That's the process, right? Yeah. Like oh, this two-step oh process. Actually, there's one more question I forgot. The first app you open up when you start your day. Oh, okay. So I saw, you know, I heard that in, in, in Sonny's interview. Does it count if it's email or is it after the email? <laughs> okay. Because email has got to be it, I think, for the majority of the people. Actually, I recently um, had a podcast with um, Manny Saxena. He okay. is from uh, 2014 full-time MBA. Sorry, not MBA, MBA. Okay. Uh, he had the same Exact same answer, like who doesn't open the email app in the well, morning? <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, I don't want to interview you, but what's your first thing? I think my first thing is the new site that I follow. Like, okay. Yeah, my browser, uh, my news, basically. Okay, your yeah. news. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So, Matthew, can you start by giving our listeners a brief introduction to your? background in your journey to founding MTT Ventures and acquiring this beautiful business, Trans, Trans Machine. Absolutely. So to say I've done one thing in my career is, I, I don't know if I could really illustrate that, right? Mm -hmm. I've done almost everything you can do in some form of a manufacturing environment, whether it be transmission parts like Trans Machine or pharmaceuticals. I've, I have done finance, I've done m and I've done operations, I've done sales, general management, you name it. And, you know, I think that's something that we're probably going to talk about a little bit later. But, you know, in my career, I started out in what I would call like a private equity company. I, I didn't even know it. You know, mm -hmm. a couple of, you know, family members of a, a business that were acquiring companies hired me out of Georgia Tech. And I didn't even know what this was. And they're like, hey, stick around with us and you can run a, you can run a business you know, at age 25. And that was exactly what they did. And, and as you, you know, you, you know, you come out of school, I don't know the, how this was for you, but you come out of school and you're like, I'm going to work in Atlanta. I'm going to work for Home Depot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work for Coca-Cola and I'm going to sit in a cubicle and I'm going to do really, really finite tasks. And then I'm going to move up from man, you know, analyst to manager. And then, mm -hmm. and, and I've appreciated that I haven't taken that route per se, because as you walk on the floor, I'm out on the floor, you know, a dozen to two dozen times a day, it helps you understand really in your career what you're, you're touching what's going on, right? As opposed to, you know, working for a math, and I've worked for big companies, right? But, you know, I appreciate that level of experience because it's more tangible to you mm -hmm. rather than managing a business from a thousand feet. So I didn't answer your question per se, but I mean, I'm a finance guy and, and, and kind of started that way and then got into to sales and, and general management. And let's, this is great. You just talked about the evolution yeah. um, of your career by, uh, by mentioning the functions. Yeah. Um, and I would say maybe critical, critical like breaking points that, that happened to you that brought you to acquiring and running a business. And I think one portion of that was also founding and parent company yeah. for for acquisitions. Yeah. Yeah. So we will definitely get like yeah. get into more details on these. But I just want to focus on the background part and um, a little bit more to talk about like your specific experience yeah. at specific uh, locations sure. and companies. So prior to joining Transmission as an owner and operator, um, you were with a really large uh, company, right? Like yeah. you, I, you were with um, the filtration group. Yep. And I think you had multiple roles um, during your journey there. Um, can you talk about like that a little bit? Like what did you do uh, with filtration group and in your previous employment? Can you yeah, share sure. like the highlights of your corporate America career with the listening audience? Well, so I can say... Without a doubt, you've never lived in life until mm -hmm. you've worked in automotive. <laughs> you know, so so I, I've been in all these different verticals. I've been in what you call general industry, pharmaceuticals. Uh, I've been in aftermarket. I've been in trans transmissions now. But in the automotive market, mm -hmm. it is so cutthroat. 
it is, you know, when you're rounding anything to the thousandths or ten thousandths of a decimal point, mm -hmm. that's when you know it's it's real and, and it's ruthless. And there's nothing I've ever experienced in my life that's so logical and so pragmatic as automotive. And that was, you know, I, I was, you know, working in an automotive vertical, running mm -hmm. a, running a commercial team across a couple of different regions for for filtration group. But that was one of the the most it was one of the most transformational experiences for me because I don't know how, you know, the industries that you've worked in, these, these, you know, automotive, it shapes you in a way where literally how you get in to the building from walking from your car, you have to ask why. Mm -hmm. And the five whys, the Toyota production system and all this stuff, it governs everything. And so for me, coming from, you know, different verticals, this really firmed up my thought process from a business standpoint of, okay, why are we doing that? What, what are the costs? Right? You just, it, it really focuses you and causes you to question everything in a really insanely analytical way that no other industry or segment that I'd ever been a part of. And that was at filtration. We were selling hydraulic filtration that, you know, what kind of car do you drive? Um, and I drive an SUV, okay. a Honda CRV, and I also have a Camry. Okay. So thank you for being a customer on the Camry, not on the Honda CRV, <laughs> one <laughs> okay. of the ones. But it was a company that had, you know, 65% market share in the US, well, 60, and then 75% in, in, in Europe. So you're talking about this, you know, really small segment of the world that was covering an enormous amount of, 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 of you know, one of the world's largest industries. And so when you when you look at that and you're dealing with Ford and GM and Toyota and the mm -hmm. like, there's there's this just every single day, every decision has to be prepared, vetted, analyzed. It's not one of these things where you get into other segments where you're like, ah, we really don't know we're going to price it. I don't know how we're going to handle this. You, you, you get slaughtered. I mean, those guys, and, and you get into a, a space where they've, especially on the purchasing side, they've stamped metal and they've injection molded plastic for 50, 60, 100 years in the case of metal. And so when you're trying to present them with a justification or a rationale, those guys are already so far ahead of you. And at the same time, you're all, they're also your customers. So you've got to understand how to service them to make them happy, what milestones create happiness, not just chasing happiness. And it was that to me was how do you drive exponential profitability? We tripled EBITDA while I was there, I like using mm -hmm. operating income more than EBITDA, but we tripled EBITDA while I was there. And while you were doing that, you're trying to overserve your customers. You're trying to create this, this environment where they love to do business with you rather than you go, you put a gun to their head and go, eh, I'm going to double my price. And that's how you get to, to triple profitability. So that was the one in, in terms of my career, the last stop, that was the thing that I think propelled me forward was just the sheer logical nature of the automotive space. You had a very strong, thank you very much for yeah. sharing like these highlights from your corporate America yeah, yeah. career. Um, and you spent quite a lot of time, a lot of time in the auto industry, automotive industry, and you highlighted how quantitative the decision-making yeah. processes are over there. I'm curious as a person who I'm a finance trade general um, management like person yeah. right now. And that's where I am in my career. And my starting point was also finance. Uh, and I have this question for you. Uh, you had a lot of sales roles, I think, mm -hmm. within filtration group and before that. Mm -hmm. So how could you pivot from finance yep. to sales? Yes, the auto industry, automotive industry, it requires a quantitative mind. But how about you having the starting point like from finance and having the transition from finance to sales and from sales to general management. How did these transitions happen um, for you in your case? I think the best way to answer that question is mm -hmm. with a question to you. What do you want to be when you grow up? Okay. And so even when, you know, you're, you're going to college mm -hmm. or whatever, your MBA break, and even every day, you need to be assessing, what do I want to be when I grow up? For me, I knew I wanted to control my own destiny in mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form. And so the career track that I chose, I was always looking to get 
skill sets that eventually I knew I would need to use when I was, con- you know, in control in quotations, controlling my destiny. If my wife ever listens to this, I, I don't control my destiny. My wife controls my destiny, but uh-huh. at least you have some measure of control. And, and that was always on, that was always in my mind, right? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I wanted to run my own business. Mm-hmm. I always did. And it was always a measure of trying to find how the experience I had in life that I didn't want to force, you know, I didn't want to get into something, you know, like software or something like that, where I had, some level of, of industry expertise, how could I you know, control my own destiny through that? And so, you know, to re- directly answer your question, every step of my career was using finance, sales, general management, operations to further that goal of what did I wanted to be when I grew up. And, and I think the two questions that anyone to simplify it even further needs to ask is, what do you want and how do you get it? And when you ask those two questions, everything just naturally falls into place. And I think, you know, in, in we've you know both gone to the same, you know, phenomenal MBA programs. Mm-hmm. Those are things that people may ask, but they don't internalize. They don't really reflect and go, what do I want to be? You get caught up in the cop- corporate ladder and you go, I want to be a, a vice president. Mm-hmm. I'm a director. I want to be a vice president. What does that, what does that get for you? Does that further your goal of what you want to be when you grow up. And, and so for me, finance, sales, operations, general management was all part of that, that formula that you need to run your own business because literally every minute of every day I'm testing one of those, mm-hmm. you know, as you're talking to the OSHA guy, you're, you know, you're, you're OSHA consultant, you're trying to think about, all right, what part of my experience do I tap into where I know what good looks like? Because that's the other thing mm-hmm. is you've, you've, you know, and, and, and maybe you can talk about this, but the people that have influenced you so positively in your life, you're ref- you're looking back to them for what good looks like. You're not, you know, yes, you can try and create it on your own and, and, you, and you've got that, but each step in your career, whether it be in sales or finance or whatever it may be, you're looking for that influence that says, man, this is, this is what we want and this is, this is how we're going to get it. So then uh, will it be possible to say in your case that you – knew very early on what you really wanted to be when you grow up. So basically you had this vision of running your own business from very early on. I, I think you said that, but I just wanted to confirm that like again, uh, possibly. So you had this like vision inside and finance was just like an entry point for you to complete that journey. And then you felt ready And then you said, okay, now I, I feel ready and I'm going to run my own business, right? A hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent. Then you mentioned Kellogg. Um, what is the Kellogg impact on your professional and personal life? I, I, I always look at it in, you know, the, the, the null hypothesis way. What, it, what would my life have been if I didn't have it, right? Mm-hmm. If I hadn't moved... to Chicago, and if I hadn't made the decision to apply to, to, to them and Booth and Notre Dame and Loyola, and I can't remember who else, but if I'd have stayed in Atlanta and I'd gone to Emory or Georgia Tech, what it would have given me? Great, great programs, great schools. Mm-hmm. But we're sitting here together today talking because of the one thing that Kellogg has above and beyond anywhere else in the world, mm-hmm. and as the rankings kind of bear it out, U.S. world news rankings bear it out, the value of the network. I wouldn't, my investors at all the, you know, venture capital or, 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 you know, current, you know, private holdings that we have for Transmachine here are Kellogg alums. They're seated at, you know, all of my interactions, all of the connections that you, you know, are, we're sitting here because of Greg Hanafy at, at, at Kellogg, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, shout out to Greg. And, and, and that's, that to me is what the program was about. The content probably was no different than it was at Notre Dame or University of Chicago or Georgia Tech or Emory or the, these schools you know, that I looked at. And so if I had stayed there, I don't think I would be in the same spot. I mean, would you have been in the same spot? Uh, no, um, definitely. Yeah. I have very similar uh, feelings uh, about Kellogg. And for the listening audience, like Greg Hanifi is the uh, associate dean of uh, Kellogg School of Management who... I literally introduced like yeah. us, right? Yeah, literally. <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, great. But then back, you were also in Ellen, in the Ellen Center, right? Like you were an executive, yeah, yeah, executive MBA, yep, yep. executive MBA, EMP um, 100. Yep, great. And we are right now at Trans Machine yep. in in Aurora, uh, Illinois. Can you tell us like what your vision is for uh, this company? And a little bit background about uh, Trans Machine and what's your vision sure. with this company? All right, so we'll go. I, I think there's there's two topics here. We'll, we'll talk about what I want to do in general. So the kind of mm -hmm. supporting what I want to what I want to be when I grow up, and then how that is micro related, you know, to Trans Machine. So my goal in my life is to make an a positive impact on the world. Okay. Everybody has that, but it's true. And you, and you know, and I've had so many conversations. I was just in, in Michigan Monday and I was speaking with a, a very high level person at Freudenberg and they had the exact, they're you know, looking to, to purchase a business and, and they had the, I want to make a positive impact on the world. Well, yeah, that's what, that's the end game here. Right. And that may be the, you know, helping climate change or whatever it may be. And you go, Matt, you bought a, a company that does nothing but produce parts to en enable <laughs> <laughs> the fossil fuel industry. It's a beachhead, right? And so now to take it down to Transmachine, Transmachine is the beachhead of providing, I mean, this company, 40 years in, in business. And if I told you the impact that they've had on the space for the size of company, it's amazing. I mean, the, the customer service, the focus on what the customer needs are is unparalleled in my opinion. And so how do you take something that is, you know, a family owned business 40 years that has this impact on, on, you know, a space that no one really talks about, you know, everyone's talking about electric vehicles, somebody's talking about, you know, in, internal combustion transmissions. And so taking the, this business as it stands, using the beachhead and expanding on that phenomenal customer service experience. So if you, Vulcan, were a transmission rebuilder and you said, I need, you know, taking a transmission apart, I need it. Your client, whether it be a school district, a fleet, you know, with a, a garbage truck or an ambulance or a fire engine, they have uptime requirements. And these... You know, the, the trans machine owners, previous owners, figured out that if they overperform to that, you call and buy the same day, by the time you hang up the phone, the same day, the parts are out. That helps you accomplish your goal of, up, a goal of uptime. And that's taking that concept of, hey, over, you know, out over serving the customer and then applying that to, you know, going up and down the value chain through, you know, an acquisition or jumping into other industries where they don't, you know, they're not being satisfied. At the end of the day, Transmachine to me is a great first step in a series of steps and where we're going to take it. And again, all around, you know, it sounds so cliche, cl customer satisfaction and giving, helping your customers achieve what they want. And, and that to me is, is so basic, but so many times it's kind of like what you want to be when you grow up. It's not internalized, right? People really don't think about this. Like, Hey, I'll give you an example. Well, you know, I'm signing a check yesterday and I go, what is this for? I asked one of our accounting people, I said, what is this for? It's for our hold music. And so I go, hold music and I call into the main line. There's no hold music Vulcan. And now, just by that one step of being curious, I now get to see what our customers experience. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think our customers care if they have hold music or not. I think that they care that how quickly they get serviced. So immediately, I canceled that because no one waits. I can't even answer the phone around here that people are getting to it so fast. That's the type of experience that I, one I'm proud to be a part of. Two how many times have we had that negative experience? I mean, name the call the cable company, something that you just, you're, it's a disaster. Service matters. And if you can replicate that into industries where people have basically decided that it isn't about service, you know, the customer experience, I, I think that's, it, it's a good beachhead to go and then apply it to other industries. Which comes back to you um, as like a, 
it's it's a, it's a fulfilling experience for you to do a very good job, like in satisfying the customer needs. And can you tell us, um, the listening audience, to me and the listening audience, um, maybe top three projects that are happening here right now at Transmachine um, to put the company and then what it does into context for the listening audience. Like, what are you guys like working on right now? Um, can you name us two or three projects you guys are currently working? A hundred percent. So the first thing, when, whenever you get into any type of manufacturing environment, the number one thing and the first thing that I talked about is safety, right? So walking around, ensuring that everyone, there, there is no exception for safety. So, uh, you know, these things sound trivial, but the first or second time I walked the floor, there was a gentleman here that had been here about, about a year and a half. And I said, uh, hey, Joey, I said, you know, give me an idea. Is there anything you need? He goes, you know what? There is actually. He said, we need mats on the inside of the building. I go, mats? I walk around and you, there are three doors that didn't have no slide, you know, the, the, the stick mats where you can, you know, step on them and they don't move. And I said, okay. He goes, because what happens is, it snows, as it often does in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I go step inside, and now there's no mat. There's a mat on the outside, but there's not a mat on the inside. Okay, well, your feet slip, and now you have a now you have a slip and fall, mm -hmm. which anybody in the OSHA space knows. Killer. For, and now, who's suffering because we didn't put a mat down? Our customers. Who's suffering even more? Our employees. And so, within, I told him, I said. The mat guy, you know, the, the, the company that does our mats, they come on Mondays. I said, it's Tuesday. Next Monday, literally, I go grab the mat, you know, the guy that's, you know, walking around, you know, changing uniforms or whatever and, you know, changing out our mats. I need three more mats. Problem solved. Less than, less than five business days. The reason I'm going into detail about something so trivial as mat is that's the type of ser it's service for your customers, service for your vendors, service for your employers, Right. This concept of servant leadership, right? How many people walk the walk, right? That's what, that's the question that you've got to ask yourself is, and, and, and you got to be all in. I mean, that's the, that's the other thing is, is that, you know, I, I, you know, one of my employees today, uh, I should have been, it, it, let me take a step back. I won't say my employees, because if you look at our org chart, if I were to put up our org chart, I'm at the bottom. I did that very intentionally. I've been meaning to do that my entire career because the people that drive the profitability of the business and, and the revenue of the business are, are, are the guys that are running machines, your revenue drivers. And I always said this, I said the two most important people in any business are the people that make it and the people that sell it. Mm -hmm. No, you know, just coincidence that I happen to sell it at some point, but I think those really are, and, and everybody else is overhead, including you know the president, CEO, whatever you may be. And so to answer your question, safety. Safety is the biggest project because at the end of the day, if people are hurt, no one's making product, no one's getting paid, the company's not in, in so the, you know, the company's out of business. Uh, so that's the first one. Um, second, and I think this is something really interesting and it relates to, 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 to Kellogg in general. So Professor Karen O'Connor, uh, we, I want to get in, uh, we're looking at maybe doing an internship because we want to know where we can expand into. So the first thing, you know, number, number three after safety and after, uh, stabilizing operations is sales growth, right? And so looking into areas, so the first place you go is your existing customers. That's you, you pick up the phone, you go, what are we not doing that we can be doing? And that's the first place you go. The second place you go is, okay, all right, we've had the success where else can we go? So, you know, you're familiar with the concept of 80, 20. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, first thing you do day one, you 80, 20, the business, you look at 20% of your customers are driving 80% of your profit or your sales and you start to segment your business. That's the, you know, you, you, you simplify. And the second thing you do is you segment. And so the most obvious place for us to go is into, to expand on our oil and gas success into construction and mining. So as a tangent to sales growth, bringing in, you know, Kellogg MBA students through mm -hmm. Karen O'Connor's program is going to be one of our, our top priorities where we're going to go, hey, 
we have this phenomenal customer experience. Who else can benefit from it? And then kind of mapping that value chain and saying, all right, you know, is it a, you know, is it a construction company that we've got, you know, we get some kind of one-off sales there, or is it someone that's, you know, servicing the construction company? We don't know. And so that's where sales growth organically through our customers and then expanding into other segments through that 80-20 mindset. That's where we're going. I think it's important to highlight one thing here, which is you literally just took over the general management of this company, right? Like right. it's important like where we are in your entrepreneurship yeah. journey. Yeah. So you are literally at the very, very yeah, beginning. Yeah, six weeks it's in. Six <laughs> weeks in, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's important to to highlight that. Um and how about the products? Like, can you give us two, three examples sure. of the products that you are currently manufacturing uh, here at Transmachine? Yep. So, so we do hard parts that go into a transmission, a heavy duty oil and gas transmission mm -hmm. that, you know, is, you know, so think of anything on a fire truck, an ambulance, a garbage truck, something like that. Big heavy duty transmissions. And we make shafts, housings, those type of applications. We're, re we're doing two things primarily. We're making replacement parts for them or we're remanufacturing, rebuilding mm -hmm. something that's failed. And so, but it's all in the transmission space. So, you know, you've got a, a basic car, you've got an engine, a transmission that connects to the axles that turn the wheels. That transmission kind of modulates the, the, the engine. And so we make the part, the hard parts, steel, iron parts that go into the transmission. Thank you very much for giving uh, specific examples here. And I want to have a question about the future. Yeah. But when we were walking in the um, manufacturing area in here in, yeah. in, in the trans machine, so I saw two things happening at the same time. You had machines um, that are like cutting edge yeah. machines, but you also at the same time had some machines from from 1960s, 50s, yeah. really old machines, yeah. Yeah. right? World War II era machines. So. Yeah, and the coexistence <laughs> of these two was really um, interesting for yeah. me. And how about the future? Like how do you see the future of... Um, it, it, this may be a very broad yeah. uh, question, I, I understand, but you work for a very large um, global industrial manufacturing company. Um, and now you are running your own um, business in a very niche area yep. um, and servicing really large clients. Um, and how do you see the future? Yep. The future of industrial manufacturing specifically in the industry yep. uh, or the industries that you have worked so far? All right. So let's, uh, so let's do two things here. So I'll start with, let's talk about the machines, yeah. right? Because these are things that when you're in Kellogg, right. And you're like, Hey, I'm going to imagine doing a big deal in a class A office space in downtown Manhattan and you got everybody with their suits and you got the Mont Blanc pen and you're signing that. I, I, I mean, what you walked on the floor, this is the stuff that built this country. And it doesn't have to be pretty, right? And, and so if I showed you the most underutilized asset in this building, it's the fanciest thing. It's a measuring, you know, measuring you called a CMM that is, it, it, it does these micro, micron level precision, but it's, it, it never gets used versus the thing that was built by Pratt and Whitney in the 1940s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and can run literally runs with hydraulic fluid in it. No digital apparatus on it. Just you know, just runs on hydraulic fluid. And and it all goes to, you know, the the perspective that we had in school that, okay, it doesn't have to be pretty to be effective. And and that's the takeaway I want everyone to have is you know you never judge a book by its cover. You never you never look at something in manufacturing and go oh gosh. I don't want to buy that. That thing is, it's dirty. You're going to get your hands through. Let's do software. Let's do B2B SaaS Falcon. We don't want to do dirty transmission parts. That's the first thing is you, you, you really have to, to push down the reflex to go, let's buy the robot 
and stick it in front of the CNC because it's cool and because I read about it. No, it doesn't matter. And so that's the first thing. Second thing, um, going back to mega trends here, you know, so everyone that's listening to this are going to go, this guy bought a transmission business. Are you kidding me? We're all going to be driving battery powered vehicles here soon. I hate to break it to you. That's a problem. Electrification for this business is a problem and, and absolutely climate change is on us and we've got to do something to, to abate it. In this space, I have one question for you, Vulcan. Let's say something tragic happens to your neighbor, their house catches on fire. The fire truck pulls up, it connects, the pump, you know, that pumps the water connects to the fire hose and it starts running. It takes them 12 hours to put out the fire. My question to you is, do you want at hour nine the batteries dying in that fire truck and the firemen coming over to your house going, hey, Vulcan, can we... Can we plug in the fire truck to your outlet? Because we seem to be running out of, uh, out of bat. That's it's the change is here for electrification, but in this space, heavy duty truck, oil and gas construction, mining for transmissions. It, 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 it's not going to be in my lifetime. It's going to be maybe my daughter's problem or my son's problem. And so electrification's there. Mm -hmm. um, I think what, and, and this is a question maybe for you too. Anything, anybody that's associated with industrials, any type of industrial manufacturing, have you noticed the rate of innovation decelerating? So if you look at the number of engine platforms or transmission platforms in the component requirements in those spaces, temperature, pressures, materials, anything, and it can be any industry, it can be automotive, it can be aerospace, it doesn't matter. The rate of innovation, I think, is slowing down. Waiting for that next radical initiative to come along where you had transmissions, you had internal combustion engines, you know, jet engines, right? I think there's something that's going, there's got to be an inflection point because there's not, people are not releasing new transmissions, Vulcan. Yep. You know, Caterpillar's not. So I I work I used to work for Eaton. Yeah. Uh, oh, great company. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any connections? I need to I need to see if I can develop some sales. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eaton. Uh, I was in the hydraulics business, but then mm. we were working very closely with the vehicle um, division and the aerospace yeah. uh, division. And yeah, and I also had some. I was in an FP&A role. We had some MR MRO specific uh, locations. Um, yeah, very similar scenery, like in their yeah. uh, stuff, in their, I will say, factories. And it was great to be um, in a real manufacturing environment again today. But coming back to these um, trends and the future of industrial manufacturing, um, I think you you really made it, you just shared great points like here. Thank you very much for, yeah. um, for, for, for these. Um, and... I want to go back to the transition, like yeah. to you, like personally. First, let me tell you one thing. After listening you for about like thirty-five minutes at this point, now it makes sense why you like, why why you, why you find laundry worse and prefer washing the dishes. So <laughs> you, <laughs> I think you really, you don't mind like getting your hands dirty. And Wait a it second. Seems that That's you, a great question. I need to ask that in an interview now. That'll really kind of drive some insight for some people. That's yeah. a, I didn't think about that. I'm going to steal that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, the transition, right, from corporate America to, yeah. I think we can call this as entrepreneurship through acquisition, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So, this one and this space is getting really very popular, um, but you really need to be ready to get your hands dirty. And also for seasoned corporate America professionals like yourself, there's really a very important transition, right? I think emotionally. How did you, how was this like transition for you emotionally? Because all of a sudden like, from being a board member of a global company and running an organization with thousands of people like in it, right? Owning in a massive PNL, uh, having really a huge like PNL responsibility and talking to the um, really big clients like left and right around the globe. Um, 
having this transition, owning like a much smaller PNL, smaller teams, and having these restrictions, right? Like um, transitioning from almost resource unlimited environment right. to like a very resource limit, very limited like resource environment. How was this transition, and how is it going for you emotionally? Oh, <laughs> oh emotionally? <laughs> uh, well, I you know, ask me in two months, right? Is I fanatically re hit refresh on the bank account every day? Uh, no, uh, you know, look, the let's start with emotionally. You never know how you're going to react until it's your money, right? That's at stake. Your family, your house, you know, your invest. By the way, you know, those people that came along with me on the journey at Kellogg that are now my investors, I have a, I have an obligation yep. to them, right? And, and, you know, if I fail, I mean, that's going to get through the network. You know, so, so, you know, that's the first thing is you have to be confident with where you're at in life in your career to do this. If you're, you know, if, if you're in a manufacturing environment, you don't want to get your hands dirty, then you shouldn't do an acquisition, right? If you don't want to, you know, I've had multiple guys on the floor as I'm walking the floor, they're like, hey, you know, come over here, I'll teach you how to run the mill. And you're like, let's do it. And so the reason I'm saying that is, you know, we're, it, it, a lot of private equity and, you know, people that are in private equity, don't shoot me after I say this, but a lot of people in private equity, they want to run it, run the business from the income statement, the balance sheet. Okay. That's okay. You got to know the income statement. You got to know the balance sheet. You got to know the statement of cash flows. There's no doubt that you've got to know that. But at the end of the day, it's the people driving them. And this is what I loved Kellogg more so than any other program because it was about the people, right? It was... It was making connections with people. And that's what that is when you walk the floor and you ask someone, what would you do if you had to make one change? And the guy goes, mats. And you go get mats less than a week later. And then it snows and ice everywhere the next day. Like, that's, it's about people. And yes, I fanatically watched the balance sheet. I fanatically watched the P&L. But it's about the people. Coming back to the emotional transition, right? If you're going to do entrepreneurship through acquisition, you, especially if you've been in a large company environment, you've got to be prepared to go in and connect with people, right? And, and, and I don't mean run a machine or sweep the floors. People kind of overuse that stuff. You've really got to be in the detail and then come right back up. That's what most of my day is, is really getting in. I'm six weeks in, getting into the detail, understanding, okay, what is the chart of accounts? Okay. Who can weld? So when our welder takes vacation and all the welding jobs stack up, I have to go find interns that I can bring into the pipeline of employees to de-risk the fact that my welding guy want to take a holiday. And so those are the things that, you know, an emotional transition, if you're not comfortable with change, then this isn't for you. If you're comfortable with, you know, an annual report style way of communicating with a lot of polish and a lot of you know, focus on the financials, but not understanding the people that drive them, both your customers, your vendors, your employees. It's not for you. And now you're an entrepreneur. And at some point, everyone was an entrepreneur, right? In the history. And I think it's the oldest profession. Right? Yeah, the oldest profession. <laughs> it and has then, to be. <laughs> and I think I'm I'm seeing this entrepreneurship through acquisition space like heating up, really. Yeah. yeah. And which is a great thing. Like, I really think that since everyone was an entrepreneur, like at some point in history, right? Um, and I would say in the past, it's a good thing that this is happening. Yes. But I'm also hearing from you, it's really not for everyone. Especially when you are transitioning from um, like big corporate into this area, one needs to be really, one needs to be really careful. And what I'm hearing from you is being able to connect being able to connect with people seems to be a very important driver. 
or very important, um, I would say, skill that yeah. everyone needs to be good at. And what advice, in addition to being able to really connect with people yeah. and understand the processes and have a good like emotional um, intelligence, like in terms of like people management, what additional advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who are looking to enter the search fund slash sure. ETA, ETA space like you did? Yep. Yeah. I, I think first off, you've got a, you've got to differentiate between search fund where you own a minority mm -hmm. of the business uh, where you are an owner of the business, but maybe not in a decision, final decision-making capacity where you're governed by a board, you're governed by majority investors, right? And then, eat, you know, entrepreneurship through acquisition where you are the, you know, either the sole owner of the company or you have the vast majority of the voting shares, whatever it may be, you know, owner, you know of the cap table. So those are the two things. Uh, advice for the ETA group, right? First off, you really have to have an honest conversation. What do I want to be when I grow up? What do I want in life and how do I get it? Once you, and, and, and everybody does this, they have those, they, oh, well, I ask myself what my goal is, goal, strategy, tactics, implementation, control. Thank you, Professor Chernoff. Those things that, asking those questions and getting real honest answers and asking other people to answer those questions for you. Do you see me as a president of a business, a $1 million, $10 million, $100 million business? And, you know, if you're a lifelong finance guy, lifelong operations guy or girl or woman or person, they, these, and you've never stepped out of those bounds, it may be a difficult step for you. The other thing is having some manner of subject matter expertise, right? Not, you know, so I, that was the thing that I was faced with is I looked at the landscape of companies to acquire. I could have done virtually anything, but the problem was if I didn't have some level of subject matter expertise, how can you trust but verify? It's impossible. And, and so that was, you know, I just happened to be in the automotive transmission space just coincidentally but if i hadn't have been in that space if i'd have been at you know my previous company freudenberg i had some i had touched it at some point lightly even though i wasn't in this exact space i knew enough where i didn't have to worry about getting while getting the company up to speed i didn't didn't have to get myself up to speed on the industry and that's the, i think the two takeaways is one really doing a deep self-awareness assessment of what do you want to be when you grow up? And then two, having some level of subject matter. Like if I, if, if I had a college and said, Vulcan, let's go do B2B SaaS, you'd have gone, hey, Matt, have you ever done B2B SaaS? And I'd have gone, well, no, Vulcan, but I think it's cool. I think you would have paused and gone, eh, maybe, maybe this isn't you know, the best place for you to go. Matt, thank you very much for hosting me today at Trans Machine. And I really wish you Good luck with your uh, entrepreneurial journey here. And thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled, Vulcan, and I'm honored. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for diving deep with us on another episode of Lehigh Love Ego High Impact Mindset. Join us every week as we discover the stories, strategies, and insights that will empower you to grow personally and professionally. Stay inspired and catch you in the next one.